Dear YouTube, in case you are investigating this video due to a complaint about hate speech or copyright violation, allow me to give the following assurances. Firstly, a word on copyright. If the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania is unhappy because I've used their propaganda in a way they disapprove of, please know that I am very familiar with copyright law and have ensured that any use of copyrighted material in this video falls within the fair use provisions, particularly as pertain to criticism and parody. Secondly, let me ease any concerns you may have about hate speech. Though I am unapologetically a critic of the leaders of Jehovah's Witnesses, I feel no hatred whatsoever when it comes to individual believers. I have even spoken out on occasion against the harassment and mistreatment of witnesses. Rather than being hateful, this video and indeed my channel represents my attempt at respectfully offering a helpful resource for witnesses who are beginning to think of their faith as false or harmful and would like to know the other side of the argument. Hello and welcome to my review of the November 2016 JW Broadcasting episode which was hosted by Governing Body member Garrett Loesch and Governing Body helper Christopher Maver. In case you're wondering why I'm going back to 2016 to cover an old JW Broadcasting episode, it's because this particular episode was among a small number that I neglected to do at the time. I now have a bit of time on my hands, so I thought it would be interesting, with the benefit of some hindsight, to go back to this episode and see what's what. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. Christians today are ardent defenders and supporters of the truth. The Watchtower of January 15, 2012 said on page eight, quote, other champions of Bible truth rose up in the centuries that followed. Years before, the Watchtower said, this magazine will never shrink in fear from championing the truth. The Watchtower has been championing the cause of kingdom truth. It simply cannot be said that Jehovah's Witnesses as an organization are champions of truth. If you haven't already seen my recent video, Lying for Jehovah, in which I give four examples of Watchtower representatives lying on camera using what's referred to as the theocratic warfare strategy, I urge you to check that out. Basically, Jehovah's Witnesses are told in their literature that it's okay to distort the truth or hide the truth or evade the truth when it's advantageous to God's cause or to pursuit of kingdom interests. But even if we overlook the occasional lies and deceptions by Watchtower officials, including governing body members like Jeffrey Jackson, who lied before the Australian Royal Commission. Even if we say, well, these are just imperfect men, you can't expect them to behave impeccably all the time. They were in a high pressure situation and they said what came to them and it may not necessarily have been the full truth. Even if we excuse those individuals, the religion at its core is fundamentally untrue. And this is why myself and other former witnesses wouldn't go back to it even if it fixed its problems with abuse, even if it was no longer covering up child abuse, it was no longer breaking apart families through shunning, it was no longer persuading people to die rather than, rather than uh, accept a blood transfusion. Even if all those things were fixed, I wouldn't go back to being a Jehovah's Witness because the religion just simply isn't true. Or the best you can say is that it's no more true than any other religion. A lie is a false statement deliberately presented as being true, a falsehood. A lie is the opposite of the truth. 
Thank you, Garrett, for explaining to us what a lie is. Seriously, it feels like in almost every episode of JW Broadcasting, there is a moment where they stop and define very simple, rudimentary words to their audience, the expectation being that this is a word that they need to explain. Um, I think most people who are watching this know what a lie is and don't need to have the definition explained to them. Lying involves saying something incorrect to a person who is entitled to know the truth about a matter. But there's also something that is called a half-truth. The Bible tells Christians to be honest with each other. Again, if you watch my Lying for Jehovah video, I zero in on the significance of that particular JW definition of lying. In other words, it's only lying if you're lying to someone who is entitled to know the truth. So if you're speaking to someone who, as far as Watchtower is concerned, is not entitled to know the truth, for example, you're in a legal setting where you're defending the organisation and that involves misrepresenting what the organisation does, or if you're speaking to a journalist who is asking uh, questions that are a little bit too probing, well, these are people who aren't necessarily entitled to know the truth. So it's okay in those situations to tell a lie. As to lies, there are different types. Some politicians have lied about matters they wanted to keep secret. Companies sometimes lie in advertisements regarding their products. What about the news media? Many try to report events truthfully but we should not be gullible and believe everything newspapers write or everything we hear on radio or see on television. This feels a little too specific. It seems that Garrett might have in his mind negative news media about Jehovah's Witnesses and he is warning uh, his audience, the Jehovah's Witnesses who are watching this episode, he's warning them not to take the media seriously. He's basically doing what Donald Trump does and blasting anything that might be negative or critical as fake news. And don't get me wrong, I'm as skeptical when it comes to the news media as anyone else. I just think that the facts of a story should be scrutinized on their own merits. So in other words, if a story is reported in a newspaper or on a TV news program, and you investigate and find out that actually what they're saying really did happen and it's being portrayed accurately, then we know that it's truthful. But if you automatically dismiss anything that is in the news media, or particularly anything in the news media that is critical of an organisation with which you are affiliated, you run the risk of leading a very blinkered existence and actually being uninformed about some of the more harmful aspects of the organization that's being criticized. Then there are religious lies. If Satan is called the father of the lie, then Babylon the Great, the global empire of false religion, can be called the mother of the lie. Individual false religions could be called daughters of the lie. Some lie by saying that sinners will get tormented in hell forever. Others lie by saying, once saved, always saved. Again, others lie by saying that the earth will be burned up on Judgment Day and all good people will go to heaven. Let's just get one thing straight. What Garrett Loesch is talking about here is not a case of truth versus lies. What we're dealing with here are religious beliefs. Beliefs that are based on sacred texts specifically in this case the Bible. And when it comes to pretty much any one of those issues that he's talking about, you can find verses for it and verses against it. And it's not enough to simply say, oh well, if God is a God of love, then he by necessity can't uh, punish people forever in hell, therefore hell isn't real because you're presupposing that the Bible can't contradict itself when in fact the Bible repeatedly contradicts itself. Bottom line, if you want to believe in hell, 
there are Bible verses you can find to support your position. If you don't want to believe in hell, there are verses you can find to support your position. If you want to believe in the Trinity, there are verses you can find to support your position. If you don't want to believe in the Trinity, there are verses you can find to support your position. It really is just a matter of belief and what you want to believe. And what Garrett Loesch is doing here as a religious leader is, he's, is he is framing his beliefs as truths. So that if you don't share his beliefs or his truths, then by necessity you are spreading lies. This is classic cultic black and white us versus them rhetoric. What if an entrepreneur tells his bookkeeper to falsify the entries in the books in order to save on taxes? This lying to the tax office is certainly a serious lie. It is a deliberate attempt to mislead somebody that has the right to know. It also robs the government of what they have established as legal income. This is very interesting because as an example of lying, Garrett Loesch talks about companies who give false information to the tax office so that they don't have to pay as much tax. But of course, Watchtower as an organization is tax exempt because it's considered in most countries to be a religion. In the United Kingdom, this tax exemption also comes with charitable status. And not so long ago, the charity laws in the UK were revised so that in order to be a charity, you had to demonstrate what's called public benefit. So in other words, a charity has to prove that it is beneficial, not just to its own members, but to the public in general. And immediately you think of Watchtower and Jehovah's Witnesses, and you think, well, it's not really benefiting anyone other than the leaders. Because the whole point of Jehovah's Witnesses is to preach the good news about the coming Armageddon. And the only way of surviving this Armageddon, of course, is to acknowledge the authority of the governing body. So the whole point of the preaching work is to recruit members into the organisation, to grow the organisation. There's no real tangible benefit to non-Jehovah's Witnesses, to the public in general. And yet when you look at the documents that Watchtower has, that Watchtower is required to submit to the authorities in England and Wales, there's a, I'm going to read to you a paragraph from the latest submission, the, tw the one for 2017, on public benefit. It says, as evidenced in this report, much has been accomplished by the charity in the year to advance its objectives for the public benefit. Literature has been produced for distribution to the general public on spiritual and moral values. Places of worship have been financed and new premises constructed, which are open to all who wish to benefit from the practical values contained in the Holy Bible. The trustees confirm that they have complied with their duty to have due regard to the Charity Commission guidance on public benefit when exercising any powers or duties to which the guidance is relevant. So according to Watchtower, oh, we're a charity because we print literature that we distribute to the public and we invite the public to attend our meetings. But of course, the literature that they're distributing is telling people you'd better become a Jehovah's Witness if you don't want to be destroyed at Armageddon. And the meetings that they're attending are saying to the public, you'd better become a Jehovah's Witness if you don't want to be destroyed at Armageddon. That's not public benefit. That's recruitment. That's recruitment into an organisation, an organisation that is unduly influencing people using fear to grow the organization's own interests. So going back to what Garrett Loesch is saying, 
Watchtower is guilty of the very thing he describes, of lying to the authorities so that they can get out of paying tax. Some say truth is relative. It is like saying this is truth for you and this is truth for me. This claim is not logical when it comes to religious truth. Either God is a trinity or he is not. Either the soul is mortal or it is not. Either there is a future paradise on earth or there is not. Either homosexuality is acceptable to God or it is not. Either participating in wars is permissible or it is not. Truth is definite, not relative, because Jehovah conveyed the truth to his servants. This is exactly what I was saying earlier. Religious belief is by definition subjective. It depends on what your beliefs are. It depends on what your values are. And so if you believe that God exists, but he is permissive toward homosexuals, you'll find verses in the Bible that can sort of be made to say that. You could argue, for example, that Jesus Christ never had anything negative to say in any of the Gospels about homosexuals and that he freely associated with uh, sinners and with people who were deemed to be questionable. In my opinion, that would be cherry-picking because there's no way round what it says in Leviticus 20 verse 13, namely that homosexuals are apparently deserving of death, I find that verse repulsive and I can't imagine ever again worshipping a God who would inspire that sort of thing to be said. But the point is that if you want to believe something hard enough, you're going to find justification for it, which is why, again, you can find verses that can sort of be made to say that Jesus is God, that God is a trinity, and you can find verses that say the opposite. It all boils down to what you want to believe. But in Garrett Loesch's cultic mind, it's his way or the highway. It's his truth versus everyone else's lies. At Matthew 24, 45 to 47, we read that for the time of the end, Jesus would appoint a faithful and discreet slave or governing body to explain the Bible to his followers and help them to grow in understanding of the truth. I just find this astonishing. At this point, Garrett Loesch is actually putting words in the mouth of Jesus. He's saying that in Matthew 24, verses 45 to 47, Jesus predicted that he would appoint a faithful and discreet slave or governing body. He's making Jesus say, I will appoint a governing body, when it doesn't use the expression governing body anywhere, anywhere in the Bible. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, don't take my word for it. Look, at, look it up yourself. See if you can find the phrase governing body in the Bible. What you will find is that governing body, the, fr the term governing body is a corporate term. And it's a term that Jehovah's Witnesses started using around the 1940s. It became more and more widely used in connection with the board of directors of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society to the point where eventually the organisation moved away from the president of the society deciding on doctrine to a governing body uh, deciding on doctrine. And that happened in the 1970s but you cannot say that the governing that the, the term governing body is a bible term and you certainly cannot say that this is a term that Jesus used. How ironic that in a video in which Garrett Loesch is scolding people for telling lies he himself is caught out telling a blatant lie here. Whereas Jesus teachings and the written word of God are inspired the faithful and discreet slave is not inspired, although it champions the truth. Of course, the organization has to say this, if you think about it. And I know there are a few who were shocked when in a recent watchtower, uh, the governing body said that they are neither inspired nor infallible. 
But as I pointed out at the time, that's what the organisation has always said. The leadership has always said that they're not inspired. Because if you think about it, you can't have a situation where you're saying that the Bible is inspired and therefore inerrant and the governing body is inspired but also uh, prone to making mistakes. If you're inspired, you're writing directly from the Holy Spirit but if you are not inspired, then you get to make excuses when you screw things up. But what Watchtower does is it engages in these word games where it says, well, the governing body isn't inspired, it's just guided, it receives guidance from the Holy Spirit. But as I've repeatedly argued, these are synonyms. They, <laughs> they are words that can be used interchangeably. So if someone is inspired by God, they're being guided by God. And if someone is guided by God, they're receiving inspiration from God. Uh, it's simply word games. Nevertheless, the faithful slave provides spiritual food. Whereas in the first century, there was supernatural knowledge available for apostles and Bible writers. In the time of the end, Jehovah does not bestow this miraculous gift anymore as explained at 1 Corinthians 13, 8. How convenient, because if Gerrit and his pals can no longer receive supernatural knowledge, that gives them a convenient excuse whenever they make mistakes. They can just say, well, we're just imperfect men trying to dispense spiritual food that's been received from God by some other means other than supernatural knowledge. Although there is no divine inspiration today, still Jesus leads his people progressively through the services of the faithful slave. Jesus trusts that the imperfect faithful slave will do its best to convey spiritual food. Do you also trust the slave? Here again, Garrett Loesch is literally putting words in Jesus' mouth, which is easy to do when someone's dead, isn't it? So he said earlier that Jesus um, predicted a faithful and discreet slave or governing body. Apparently, Jesus Christ predicted the governing body. And he also says here that Jesus supports the faithful and discreet slave. So do you. Very, very easy to do that with someone who is either dead or completely invisible and undetectable to mankind. Whereas the truth of God's word does not change, our understanding of the truth does change because we are not perfect yet. We understand more about the truth today than Christians in the first century. Do we keep up with the progressive understanding of truth? Daniel was told, many will rove about and the true knowledge will become abundant. This is a gradual process. We are still roving about. And interestingly, this roving about includes flip-flops. So that rather than it being purely progressive, it's backwards and forwards to the point where it sort of resembles a man-made organization that's just making it up as it goes along. And the best example is that when, in the days of Charles Taze Russell, the organization had elders. So every congregation had elders. And then, in the, under the presidency of Joseph Rutherford, he got rid of the elder arrangement and had it so that every congregation had a company servant who was directly answerable to the organization. This effectively made power more centralized with Watchtower because it limited, um, it limited the number of people who were in the chain of command. If there's only one person in the congregation who's directly answerable to Watchtower, there's going to be less complications with the will of the organization being, um, being done by the, by the congregation. But then in the 1970s, they got rid of that and went back to having elders. So that's a flip-flop. You go from elders to no elders to elders again. How is that progressive? 
That seems to me to be just going round in circles. But how do we know we have the truth? At Pentecost 33 of our common era, true Christians numbered only about 3,000. Today we are millions, and on average, every weekend, more than 5,000 are getting baptized. But this in itself is not proof that we have the truth. Truth is not measured in numbers. Why do we know we have the truth? For one, because we remain in Jesus' teaching, John 8, 31. Again, what is or isn't Jesus' teaching is highly subjective, which is why you have all the different Christian denominations to begin with, because they all believe pretty much whatever it was that they want to believe and can find scriptures to support their beliefs. And if you were to take to one side a member of any one of these hundreds or thousands of Christian denominations and ask them whether they are following Jesus' teachings, the answer would be yes. When it comes to what Jesus' teachings actually are, it really is a matter of choice because the Bible is so ambiguous and there is so much room for interpretation. Second, we know we have the truth because of the deep bond of love for each other. John 13, 35. Apparently, if you set up a religious organization where all the members have strong love for one another, you have already met one of the criteria for your religion to be God's one and only true faith. Third, we know we have the truth because our conduct adheres to the high moral standards of truth. John 15, 10. And when we say the high moral standards of truth, what we mean is the moral standards of an organisation that has been found to cover up child sex abuse on a breathtaking scale. Fourth, we know we have the truth because we remain neutral in the controversies of the world, as Jesus advised at John 17, 14. So, if you happen to be a pacifist, congratulations! It turns out that you too are meeting one of the criteria for being God's one and only true religion. Fifth, we know we have the truth because we are God's named people. Acts 15, 14 speaks of a people for his name. So, as long as you call God by a name and not just God or Lord, Again, congratulations, you have met one of the criteria in Garrett's box-ticking exercise, whereby if you can tick enough boxes, you automatically become God's one true religion. Jesus said, the truth will set you free. It sets us free from fears, like the fear of death, fear of the future, and an exaggerated fear of man. It also sets us free from false teachings from spiritism, and from astrology and magic. It frees us from immorality and its consequences. There are no other people on earth that are as spiritually free as we are. Do we appreciate that freedom? Look, you can say lots of things about Jehovah's Witnesses, but one thing you absolutely cannot say is that they are free. We're talking about a group of people who aren't free to decide whether they can have a beard or not, if it's a man. Who aren't free to decide what style of clothes they wear in certain situations. What entertainment they watch. We're talking about a group of people who aren't free to disagree with their leaders without being estranged from their families so that the organisation can be thought of as a captive organisation, where not all of the members are necessarily there because they genuinely believe the religion, at least a percentage are there because they literally have no other choice, because they know that if, they, if it's discovered that they disagree with the leaders, they'll be separated from their families. So I'm sorry, Garrett, there are lots of things that you can talk about when it comes to Jehovah's Witnesses, but one thing that you cannot say about them is that they are free. Truth leads to freedom. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Where the Spirit of Jehovah is, there is freedom. 
Disclaimer, this freedom may involve restrictions on beards, birthdays, higher education and tight pants. The truth penetrates schools. How so? By means of our children who preach the truth to classmates and to teachers. Do you go to school? Do you champion the truth at school? How can you do this? You do this not only by preaching, but also by your conduct, by your dress and grooming, and by taking a stand for the truth when others want you to participate in unchristian practices. You also champion the truth by remaining honest and not cheating on your exams. And Jehovah will love you for that. I'm just amazed that this is something that Garrett Loesch is proud of. This is one of his selling points, apparently, for being a champion of the truth, is that if you're a child who's a champion of the truth, guess what? You get to share your truth when you go to school. Why not just let children be children and let them learn when they go to school, rather than make them feel as though this is their assignment, this is their territory, and actually you need to bear in mind that you should use any opportunity to push your beliefs, beliefs that have been pushed on you by your parents, you need to use any opportunity to push those beliefs on your classmates. The truth also penetrates prisons. Reports have come in from many countries telling of the good work brothers are doing in contacting prisoners in various prisons, helping some to rehabilitate their lives spiritually. In a number of such institutions, regular meetings are being held and several prisoners have studied to the point of dedication and baptism. Okay, two things here. When you are preaching in a prison, you are literally preaching to a captive audience. You're preaching to people who are vulnerable because they are at rock bottom. They need some kind of hope whether it makes sense or not. They need some community to feel a part of, and you're exploiting their predicament by, by contacting them in that state and saying, guess what, I've got all the answers. If you'll only have a Bible study with me and put on a tie and come to this meeting, your sins will be forgiven, and you will be part of this community where you'll receive conditional love and you'll have this promise of being in this fantastic new world. That's exploiting people when they're at their lowest. And the second point, and this was brought out actually by Barbara Anderson. I don't know whether you watched um, the Jehovah's Witnesses episode of Cults and Extreme Belief on A&D. But Barbara Anderson brought, brought out the very good point that in prison you will find pedophiles. <laughs> you just will. And you run the risk by targeting prisons, by saying, right, we need to have a special ministry for prisons. You know, if you're a, if you're a pedophile in one of these prisons, you've got, you know what's going on in the outside world. I mean, I don't know what, what I don't know to what extent all prisons have access to the internet. But if you are a predatory pedophile and you find out about the Jehovah's Witness problem with child sex abuse and the reasons why it's such a problem and the reasons why the culture of Jehovah's Witnesses, the culture of forgiveness, the culture of confidentiality, the two witness rule, why all of those things merge and conspire to make child abuse rife within the organization. If you're a scheming predatory pedophile and you find out about that, and then a Jehovah's Witness comes and knocks on your cell door, oh yes, I'll have a Bible study, please. Because there you know that when you get out, you know exactly uh, how to play the rules. You know exactly what to do to fulfill your sick uh, craving for children. So that's one thing that Watchtower should be very, very careful of. But instead, you have Garrett Loesch crowing about the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses not only exploit prisoners in this way, 
but also potentially put children at risk by bringing potential sex offenders into the organization. The world is in utter confusion. What a blessing to know the truth. We rejoice in it. We have the truth on our lips. We have the truth around our hips. Ephesians chapter 6 says that the belt of truth is fastened around our waists. We are ready to teach it. We talk the truth and we walk in the truth. And those who continue to walk in the truth will walk in it forever. Help your students to love the truth and to live the truth, but if necessary, to be willing to die for the truth and for Jehovah. This isn't a cult, by the way. <laughs> We're not talking about an organization that requires members to lay down their lives for the leaders. Only we kind of are, because that's exactly what happens if a Jehovah's Witness finds themselves in a situation where they need a blood transfusion. Their loyalty to the organization must come first, even if it means dying for their beliefs. The truth is invincible and will conquer this wicked world. In some countries, we may have many enemies who may want to silence us. But the Apostle Paul said at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verse 8, For we can do nothing against the truth. Neither can our enemies suppress the truth. Do we appreciate that we have the truth, the only truth? Is this arrogant to say? By no means. It would be a sin if we would not say so. Jesus was not arrogant when he said, I am the truth. This is just astonishing. So what we've just heard is Garrett Loesch say, not only can it be said that Jehovah's Witnesses have the only truth, and not only is it not arrogant to make that claim, it would actually be a sin to deny that. It would be sinful to deny that Jehovah's Witnesses have God's only truth. Bear that in mind and now watch the following clip, which is Governing Body member Geoffrey Jackson giving testimony at the Australian Royal Commission in 2015. Do you see yourselves as Jehovah God's spokespeople on earth? Uh, that, I think, would seem to be quite presumptuous to, to say that uh, we are the only spokesperson that God is using. Uh, the, clear, the scriptures clearly show uh, that uh, someone can act in harmony with God's Spirit in uh, giving comfort and help in the congregations. But uh, if I could just clarify a little, going back to Matthew 24, uh, clearly, Jesus said that in the last days, and Jehovah's Witnesses believe these are the last days, there would be a slave, a group of persons who would have responsibility to care for the spiritual food. So in that respect, uh, we view ourselves as trying to fulfill that role. So in 2016, you have Garrett Loesch telling Jehovah's Witnesses that it would be a sin for them to deny that they have God's one and only truth. And a year earlier, in 2015, you have another member of the governing body, under different circumstances, admitting that it would be presumptuous to suggest that they are spokespersons for God. So I guess my question to Jeffrey Jackson and Garrett Loesch would be, which of you are we supposed to believe? The majority will not listen to the truth because they love the darkness rather than the light. The truth may expose their sinful conduct and they may not have the humility to want to repent and change. We still have to preach to them to warn them. Ezekiel was told, you must warn them from me. The principle applies to us as well. So apparently if you don't want to be a Jehovah's Witness, it's because you lack humility and you're obsessed with pursuing sinful conduct. So if you're an outsider who doesn't know much about Jehovah's Witnesses, there you go. 
this is the sort of organisation we're dealing with, one that looks down on and patronises non-believers as hopeless sinners. But you also see there Garrett Loesch referring to the preaching work as a warning work, and he references uh, verses in Ezekiel. And this is interesting for me because I am frequently getting comments on my channel from Jehovah's Witnesses who pour scorn on me for saying that witnesses believe that only they will survive Armageddon. And they say, oh, that's not what we believe at all. Only God can decide who will survive Armageddon uh, and he's going to make sure that the wicked are, de are destroyed. It doesn't necessarily mean just Jehovah's Witnesses. They seem to be either unfamiliar with what is clearly said in Watchtower publications across many decades, where this has been explicitly pointed out, or they're just not thinking things through. Because why would Garrett Loesch refer to the preaching work as a warning work if it doesn't make any difference whether you're a Jehovah's Witness or not when Armageddon strikes? And if you think about it, why have a preaching work to begin with if you get to survive Armageddon just by being a good person? Keep studying the truth. Keep spreading the truth. Keep loving the truth and Jehovah, the God of truth. Hold fast to the truth as to a lifeline, as this is what it is. By staying faithful, whether you survive Armageddon or are resurrected in paradise, you will be a victorious champion of the truth. Hold fast to the truth as though it is a lifeline, because that's what it is. The direct implication being that if you stop holding fast to the truth, if you stop being a Jehovah's Witness, you're worthy of death. Again, it's, it's there if you'll only listen out for it. And it amazes me that you have witness apologists who deny that this is an intrinsic part of being a Jehovah's Witness. But I cannot think of anything more arrogant and cult-like than insisting that everyone who doesn't share your beliefs deserves to die imminently and even praying every day for this to happen. When a dear friend or perhaps even a family member leaves the truth, it can be a very challenging situation. It can truly be a test of our faith when we see something like that take place. While watching this dramatization, Pay attention to how the mother was able to champion the truth by remaining loyal to Jehovah. My name is Gabriella. Ben and I have always enjoyed attending the meetings, but lately, it's been difficult. Something was missing. Our son. It was like watching a movie of someone else's family. believe this was happening to us. What an abominable piece of propaganda. Um, it's, it's right up there, I think, with the shunning material, the shunning videos that were shown during the 2016 Remain Loyal to Jehovah uh, Convention. And I find it interesting that this was released in the same year as that convention. Uh, so for whatever reason, Watchtower saw fit to produce not one, but two 
highly emotionally charged uh, dramatizations telling witnesses to shun their children. But what can I say? It's, it's disgusting to put parents in this situation where they are being coerced to cut off links with their children, as we're going to see in the next part. And it's also very distasteful the way they have portrayed the son, Levi, as this stereotyp stereotypical, angry, unreasonable person. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure there are plenty of teenagers who rebel and whose behaviour will be familiar to what we saw just now. But it's stereotyping anyone who wants to leave the organisation as being unreasonable and angry and bitter and vindictive the makers of this video because they themselves their minds are not their own they are under the thrall of the organization they cannot get their heads around the fact that you can simply stop believing and that doesn't make you a bad person our son Levi was no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. The elders and friends in the congregation were so supportive and understanding. Many of them watched Levi grow up, give his first talk, get baptised. I was so torn. I was disappointed in Levi for leaving Jehovah, but I was more disappointed in myself. I felt like we failed him somehow. I kept wondering how he was doing. Was he okay? It's just shocking that rather than distancing itself from this horrendous shunning policy, Watchtower is doubling down on it. It's almost like the more exposure this receives, the more Watchtower interprets this as persecution and an area in which Jehovah's organisation must stand strong and must not be seen to compromise in any way. And Jehovah's Witnesses are left in this impossible situation where they have to shun their disfellowshipped family members or live with the possibility that when Armageddon comes, and it's coming imminently according to Watchtower, they will be destroyed. So that is undue influence, that's coercion that is controlling someone through threats and through fear. Then, as hard as the past few weeks had been, it just got harder. I knew what the Bible said about quit mixing in company with anyone who is not living according to Christian standards, but I never thought that scripture would one day apply to me. Later that evening, a brother was talking about the example of Korah's sons. Jehovah confirmed that he was using Moses to lead his people, not Korah. When the people were told to move away from the rebels' tents, what would Korah's sons do? Would they put loyalty to family ahead of loyalty to Jehovah? The Bible tells us that his sons remained loyal to Jehovah and were blessed for it. That night, after the meeting, I told Ben about the text I received from Levi. 
I told him everything. How I miss Levi so much, but that I also wanted to be loyal to Jehovah, like Korah's sons. Ben admitted that he too had been struggling with feelings like mine. But then he said something that I hadn't thought of. If we were to stand between Levi and the discipline he needs, we would in effect be blocking an expression of Jehovah's love from reaching him. In fact, it's our very loyalty to Jehovah that could save his life. We agreed to continue to put our trust in Jehovah and stay loyal to him. What we're seeing is a situation where the punishment doesn't fit the crime. I don't care what Levi's done. <laughs> Probably all he's done is had sex with a consenting partner. Or he's maybe just decided he doesn't want to be a Jehovah's Witness anymore. We don't actually find out why he was disfellowshipped. Whatever it is that he's done, it can't be as bad as breaking up a family. What Watchtower is doing here is infinitely worse, especially when multiplied across all of the families that are impacted by this shunning policy. What Watchtower is doing is worse than what it is it's trying to punish, because there is never an excuse to break up a family. And the reason why this couple are having this dilemma is because their humanity is trying to break through. Their humanity is telling them that this situation is wrong, it's unnatural, they should, whatever Levi has done, whatever his personal issues may be, first and foremost, he's their son, and they should be together as a family, which, of course, if you were a Christian, is precisely what the parable of the prodigal son is all about. The son is welcomed home by his father while he's still a long way off before there is any indication of whether he is repentant or not. Something that Watchtower tends to gloss over because it doesn't fit with their narrative. Instead, they use these horrendous examples such as the one there with Korah's sons. Another one they use is Aaron's sons who are struck down with fire and Aaron is told not to mourn his sons, to not acknowledge the fact that they were once alive, and the same is expected of JW parents. They're to view their children who are disfellowshipped as though they are dead. In fact, worse than if they're dead, they are to view them as dead and not mourn them. It's been five years now, and while Levi still hasn't returned to Jehovah, I haven't given up hope on him. Until that day, I'm staying busy as a regular pioneer and focusing my energies on helping others learn about Jehovah. I've come to experience firsthand the truth of Psalm 97.10. Jehovah really does guard his loyal ones. What helped Gabriella overcome this difficult challenge? For example, when she received a text message from her son, she applies scriptural counsel to her personal circumstances. The good example of Cora's sons gave her added motivation so as not to allow her feelings for her son to dictate her actions. Instead, she was firm in her loyalty to Jehovah. Notice the use of language there by Christopher. He says she didn't allow the hurt feelings for her son to dictate her actions. A very clever use of words. The word dictate has negative connotations. So what's essentially being said here is, well, why would we let feelings dictate what we do? 
they're just feelings. Far better to let Jehovah dictate what we do. And when we say Jehovah, what we mean is Jehovah's organization. And when we say Jehovah's organization, what we mean is the governing body. So it's okay for the governing body to dictate things, but not our feelings, not our humanity. Anyone who's had someone very close to them die knows the very helpless feeling that you have, knowing that there's really nothing you can do. In that instant, when they die, your hope, your faith in the resurrection, based on the ransom, become more real to you than any time in your entire life. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 31, in a beautiful speech that the Apostle Paul gave, he highlights that Jesus' death and resurrection and the ransom was really a guarantee that we have. Here in uh, Acts chapter 17 and verse 31, he says, Because he has set a day on which he purposes to judge the inhabited earth in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and he's provided a guarantee to all men by resurrecting him uh, from the dead. So personalizing the ransom, and all that it makes possible, helps us to know that the resurrection is just not possible but that Jehovah and Jesus want to resurrect our mother, our father, our beloved husband, or a wife. They care about each person that has ever lived or died. Know them so intimately and so completely that they can resurrect them completely with all their memories and personality completely as we knew them. I mean, see, Jehovah knew that we would hurt terribly at the death of loved ones. So he gave us the ransom as his way of telling us, I know it hurts, but please know that I have the perfect solution in mind. I've spoken before about this really distasteful aspect of JW theology. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, you might be thinking, what's distasteful about what we just heard? It's giving people hope that they're going to see their dead loved ones again. Well, when you factor in what we've heard previously about truth and about championing truth and about the fact that uh, Jehovah's Witnesses need to stick as closely as possible to Jehovah's organization, even to the point of death, if necessary, or even to the point of shunning their loved ones, if that's what's required of them, you, you and you put that in, and you put this, you throw this into the mix, and suddenly witnesses are now hearing. Well, if you want to see your dead loved one again, what you need to do is be the best Jehovah's Witness you can possibly be. This is blackmail. This is hijacking the memory of loved ones and using essentially dead people as currency so that you're saying you want to see them again, you need to listen to us. You need to do exactly what we tell you to do, regardless of whether it's humane or inhumane, regardless of whether it makes sense or not. In 1960, I was attending a nursing college. There, a nurse shared some interesting thoughts with me from the Bible. Ten other student nurses also showed interest, but the college threatened us with dismissal because there was a ban on Jehovah's Witnesses. When we were shown from the Bible why true Christians are persecuted, we renewed our determination. Eventually, five of us were baptized. In time, I met Stephanus, and we were married in 1964. Because of the ban, the brothers were meeting in small groups. Our trust was in Jehovah, and we made the preaching work a matter of prayer, confident that he would help us. We saw evidence of this with the underground production of the Watchtower. Our brothers were of modest means, but they used what they had to buy a hand-operated duplicating machine, which was used in our home. After returning from our secular work, Letty and I would get busy making copies of the Watchtower. 
we would play music so our neighbours wouldn't hear the sound of the duplicator. So I don't know whether you've watched my Friday rebuttal for the Be Courageous 2018 Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses, but there's a whole lot of material like what we've just seen, where the organisation is revelling in the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses have been persecuted or even banned in the past, and it's giving examples of people who've been through those situations and how it's made their faith stronger and we see the same thing here we see betty talking about the fact that she hadn't even been baptized yet she just she was just familiar with jehovah's witnesses having been introduced to the beliefs when she was studying to be a nurse and the very fact that the organization was banned and that she was threatened with being um, having her education cut short that was enough to make her think, well, this must be the truth. Because look, we're reading the Bible and, oh, it says that Christ's followers will be, will be persecuted. Well, I'm being threatened with persecution if I join them, so this must be the truth. It's appalling logic and it's appalling reasoning. But if you are emotionally vulnerable, if something in your life is going really badly wrong... And then you have these lovely people who are calling on you and giving you this message and saying everything's going to work out well if you'll only study with us and learn about the truth. It all slowly starts to make sense. And by the time you're being introduced to the more inhumane, the more absurd aspects of the religion, you're already hooked on the more universally appealing side. Urgently, he telephoned, informing us that a house-to-house -house search was underway. Our house was full of publications, along with the duplicator and typewriters. Just after the phone call, three soldiers entered our compound to search. At that moment, I prayed silently that Jehovah would blind them. Entering the room where the duplicator and stacks of freshly printed literature were, one soldier asked, What is all this? Oh, this is a duplicator that we use to print these Bible materials. Completing his search, he went outside to the commander, who asked him, What did you find? To our utter amazement, after seeing everything, he answered, Nothing. We won't find anything here. This is exactly the sort of story that will give Jehovah's Witnesses goosebumps when they watch it. Because they'll watch that and think, oh, that sister's prayer came true. Jehovah really did blind the soldier. Okay, he admitted that he'd seen it because he said, what's this? But never mind, by the time he'd gone outside and his officer asked him what was in there, he said nothing. <laughs> but seriously... Witnesses watching this, this for them will be proof. Well, of course, this has to be God's organisation, because listen to this story. There you have evidence of intervention from Jehovah to spare his people. Well, first of all, I've already talked about, about intervention and Jehovah, and if Jehovah is intervening in situations such as this, why isn't he also intervening to stop, say, 9 million children a year who are under the age of 5 from dying. But aside from all that, what we're hearing is an example of an official looking the other way. That's what we're hearing. Who knows what the officer's reasons were? He could have had very good reasons why he decided to look the other way. It didn't have to be supernatural. He could have just been a Christian perhaps, or had some kind of warm recollections of Jehovah's Witnesses and decided to let it slip. We just don't know. But you don't get to point to that and say, well, that's proof that we are Jehovah's one and only true organisation. But that's exactly how this will be interpreted. In the late 1970s and into the early 80s, another wave of vicious persecution occurred. A number of faithful brothers were imprisoned, tortured, and murdered. I was taken from my workplace because of my neutral stand and put in prison. 
When I think about living through those difficult times, I'm reminded of Isaiah 54, 17, where Jehovah promised us, no weapon formed against you will have any success. Finally, in 1991, a liberal government came to power. They gave us legal recognition and freedom of worship. First of all, it shows all of these faces of Jehovah's Witnesses who were murdered by the regime and then quotes the scripture from Isaiah saying, no weapon formed against you will have any success. It seems they did have success because they're no longer here. They're dead. They, they were killed. So <laughs> where's the victory there? And it also talks about, um, in this testimony, the guy talks about a liberal government coming to power, which is the reason why he can now talk about it. Because human politics or human political progress came to the rescue. Whatever trials we may face, perhaps you have lost a loved one in death. Looking forward to a time just around the corner can help us endure. That's also the title of this month's music video, Just Around the Corner. You can hear the songbirds singing And you watch the clouds roll by Then you're walking in the valley as the sun shines in a clear blue sky You're welcoming your loved ones And you can't believe your eyes Yes, this earthly paradise Was just around the corner So yes, it's time for another cringe fest in the form of a music video. And this particular song, this particular music sounds very cheerful and innocent but when you see the overall message it's actually quite chilling so we start off with an older couple we now see a younger couple in paradise after so this is after armageddon they're both together there in paradise they apparently don't have a child but that's soon about to change the blessings we all share were just around the corner and every day I smile and say how good to see your happy face because once it seemed I only dreamed that you'd be in my warm embrace waiting round the corner is a world It's a promise from Jehovah It's a guarantee reality And it's hard to get downhearted When I think of what's in store It's the day I'm waiting for And it's just around the corner So yes, you have exactly what we were talking about earlier with John Ekron's morning worship video. There it's portrayed for us in this sickening, sickening song, or at least the music video for the song, showing an elderly couple in the future when they're young again, because they're now in the paradise, welcoming back their child who's died. So this is apparently something that needs to be celebrated in the form of a music video. A couple whose child has died and as a parent you just don't even want to think about the trauma of losing your child, of outliving uh, this person who you've brought into the world. You just, you don't want to think about it. And they're telling in this music video they're saying to Jehovah's Witness parents who've lost their children, well, don't worry, 
If you'll only listen to what we're telling you and obey what we're telling you to do, even to the point of shunning, even to the point of dying if you require a blood transfusion, if you'll only listen to what we tell you to do and outsource your thinking to us, we promise you that in the new system, you'll be able to welcome back your child. And actually, we've made a music video to show you what that will look like. How sickening, how low can you go? Personally, I lost my father when I was two years old. He was a soldier in World War II and was killed in battle. I never had an opportunity to get to know him. Growing up, I missed having a father because I saw everyone else had one. So I look forward to observing the earthly resurrection and seeing my physical father. And I hope that both he and my mother will want to worship Jehovah in paradise. Thank you for sharing that, Brother Loesch. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Brother Loesch. Although I'm not really sure what to do with that information. Garrett Loesch's dad was an army officer in the Second World War. And bearing in mind that Garrett Loesch is Austrian, that would mean <laughs> that his father was fighting for the Nazis. So make of that what you will, ladies and gentlemen. We're closing with a governing body looking forward to his father, who was, by all accounts, an officer in Hitler's army, being resurrected in a paradise earth. All of these good people, according to Watchtower Theology, will be destroyed when Armageddon comes just for the crime of not following Gerrit Loesch and his pals. But under certain circumstances, some really awful people can live into that new paradise earth. And don't get me wrong, it's quite conceivable that Gerrit Loesch's father was a good man. I'm sure there were lots of good men who were in Hitler's army, who'd been manipulated, or perhaps they they just did their best not to commit atrocities. I don't know. I don't know anything about his father, but I just find it an awkward detail to put on the end of a JW Broadcasting episode that has dealt with the resurrection. Anyway, <laughs> on that weird note, uh, it's time to conclude this rebuttal there's been no shortage of stuff to talk about, particularly that horrendous shunning dramatization. But again, it just illustrates how the more Watchtower is being challenged on this and asked to revisit the cruelty of this practice, the more it seems to be doubling down and telling witness parents to separate from their children who are disfellowshipped. Using this grotesque um, emotional propaganda it really is uh, disgraceful but it's precisely why I carry on doing these rebuttals to bring them to your attention and to remind you if like me you've had your life impacted by the witnesses that it's okay to have left it's okay to distance yourself from this belief system because it really is toxic so those were my thoughts on the November 2016 JW Broadcasting episode. I hope you found this video interesting. Please don't forget to subscribe for more videos. And as always, thank you for watching.